Hey everyone, welcome to Steadfast Care Planning, where we plan for care to live well. I'm your guide, Kelly Augsperger. With me today is Kevin Sibneski. Kevin is the CEO of Aegis Network. Aegis works with benefit advisors to provide employers with long-term care insurance and support services. Kevin, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Kelly. Happy to participate. Today, we are going to be talking about group and worksite long-term care insurance Kevin, can we jump right in? Sure. Jump in. Let's go. All right. Let's go. Well, I want to give everyone a quick background of what it looks like for employers and employees when we consider when there's a long-term care situation. So we know, and Kevin, I know you can back me up here and probably even provide even more statistics and evidence, but we know that elder care impacts the work life of employees, right? Very much so. And for the aging workforce... Elder care is replacing child care as the number one concern. There is an estimated 26 million caregivers that also hold jobs and mostly full time. There's a phrase or a word called presenteeism, and that means employees are physically present, but they're distracted by non-work concerns. And this costs employers many times more in lost productivity than absenteeism. Right, Kevin? Yes, Yeah. When we're talking about statistics in the workplace, there are a few ones that I think that are really important. The first is that 12% of employees take leaves of absence to handle those elder care concerns and 36% miss work days. 40% have to rearrange their work schedule. So Kevin, given this information, if employers can offer a solution to their employees and their families, enabling them to protect their families from long-term care situations, then it's a win for the family and a win for the employer, right? It really is. And it used to be we would talk about this and not get an employer to immediately start talking. Oh, yes, we see that every day. But these days, you know, over the last three to five years, employers are very aware of the elder care issues going on. But statistically, if they know of a few, most say that they don't tell their employers about what's Mm -hmm. going on with their elder care situation. So an employer knows a few, there's probably another five behind that that they don't know Mm -hmm. about. And some of the solutions that are available include long-term care insurance and support services, maybe some caregiver training, caregiver resources, right, for these family members that can be offered in from the employer through a group or worksite long-term care insurance solution. So Kevin, tell us, what's the difference between group and worksite long-term care insurance? I think people are familiar with the term group, but I think worksite is a little bit of a different term. So What does that mean? Yeah, it really came from the 90s when group long-term care insurance was a thing. So most of our employee benefits are group benefits, right? We have group long-term disability, we have group health, group life. And so when long-term care started in the workplace, it was also a group policy where the employer held the master policy and employees got certificates. The employees didn't technically have their own policy. They were part of a broader group policy. In the early days, most long-term care was grouped in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of it is their individual plans. The employer doesn't actually get a policy. The employees that buy it get a policy. And that's really more what we are talking about when we say worksite. Got it. Now, are there differences between the underwriting and the pricing when we look at this? The biggest difference in the old days, group long-term care had guarantee issue. So Mm -hmm. new hires would get guarantee issue. When you put in a plan, everyone would get guarantee issue. And then if you were a late enrollee, right, you'd already had your group offering and your guarantee issue offering and you try to get on, then it was under it. These days, if we're talking about traditional long-term care versus life with a long-term care, if we're talking about traditional long-term care, there is no more guarantee issue out there unless Mm -hmm. you have a legacy unum plan, then that might still offer some guarantee issue for the new hires. But you can't put in a new group long-term care plan because all the carriers that were offering those are no longer offering them. So when we're talking about underwriting, we're looking really at simplified underwriting, correct? Some carriers are simplified. Some carriers are full underwriting. So a lot of what we do today is full medical underwriting if it's the traditional long-term care. If we're doing the life for long-term care products where you're getting a life policy and a long-term care policy, then those still offer guarantee issue. But for traditional long-term care, they're either going to be simplified underwriting or full underwriting. And I think it's important to even talk about the distinction between traditional and life with an LTC writer for those that might not be familiar. So when we're talking about traditional long-term care insurance, we're simply talking about standalone 
pure insurance if you have a long-term care need, right? Exactly. Versus if you have a life insurance policy where we're adding a rider on there to be able to use part of the death benefit to pay for care. So those are the two main different types of long-term care policies available today. And so that's what Kevin's talking about when he says traditional and then the life with the LTC. Exactly. And most new yeah. plans going in these days at larger employers are life with a long-term care because they <laughs> do offer the guarantee issue. And yeah. when we're working with a traditional product, a traditional long-term care, we're seeing about 25 to 30% of the applicants get declined. Now mm-hmm. realize that's not everyone applying because those that have issues are more likely to apply so, you know, right. I don't think if you did 100% of a population, you'd see 30% declines. It'd be much less. And when it's a voluntary basis, people with needs and with health issues raise their hand first. And therefore, we're seeing that 25 to 30% decline rate. Got it. Health is important. <laughs> you know, when we're yeah. talking about full underwriting or even simplified underwriting, there are questions, health questions that need to be answered. And, you know, if you have a slew of medications you're on and lots of complications and health issues, you might not be able to get the coverage. So if you have an employer that is offering a guaranteed issue plan, it doesn't matter what your health is. Uh, Yeah, I think that's important to consider there too. And now for a brief message from our show's sponsor. The Steadfast Care Planning Podcast is sponsored by the CLTC, Certified and Long-Term Care Training Program, which gives financial advisors tools to discuss extended care planning with their clients. Look for the CLTC designation when choosing an advisor. Kevin, tell me what size employers can offer long-term care insurance solutions to their employees? Really any size employer. If it's one or two people, then you're going to be using, you know, an individual traditional product fully underwritten, or Mm -hmm. it could be a life and long-term care, again, fully underwritten. You're going to need to get up in the hundreds of lives before you're really going to see a guarantee issue offer uh, for the most part. You might be able to get, you know, if it's, you know, 50 lives and the employer's paying for it. There might be some guarantee issue available in the life of the long-term care, but really every employer can do it. The best part about the traditional long-term care is the employer can deduct the premiums Mm -hmm. and the benefits are tax-free. Yeah. So that's about as good as you can get, right, from a tax standpoint. Whereas if you're doing life for the long-term care, because there's life insurance in there, there are some limitations to what's tax deductible for the employer as a benefit expense. Yeah, that makes sense. What about the advantages and disadvantages between doing a worksite product versus an individual product? I mean, we've already talked about the health, right? Like that's really important. If you're getting an individual policy, it's going to be fully underwritten. So you're going to have to go through detailed questions. You know, they're going to look at your medical records. They may or may not want some type of cognitive screening, possibly medical exam, but let's talk about other things outside of the health. What's to be considered there? Yeah, I think the other thing is the pricing, right? If you're doing traditional long-term care, typically offering it to a group of employers, you know, more than one or two employees, typically, not always, but typically you'll get unisex rates, which means male and females pay the same amount. And that's going to create significant discounts for the females. Yes. Because huge. while men pay higher life insurance rates because we die earlier, women pay higher long-term care rates because they use long-term care more often. The biggest difference really from the individual to the work site will be if there's any sort of simplified underwriting offer. And if it's a smaller group, that might not be the case. The real difference is the women pay a much lower rate using a unisex pricing Men might pay a little more, you know, five or 10% more, but typically it's a, you know, 30, 40, 50% discount for the women to get that Mm -hmm. unisex rate. Yes. Huge advantage for women if you're able to get this in the workplace. What about as far as funding it? Are these typically employer funded 100%, a combination of employee and employer or voluntary? What are you seeing? All of the above, really, but more often than not, the larger the employer, the less funding. If you are talking a 5,000 employee group, typically the employers don't fund much at all, if any. Or they might carve out some executives, which you can do with long-term care as well. You can discriminate with long-term care as long as it's, you know, not based on age or gender, that sort of thing. But you could say the executives or the vice presidents and above we're going to pay for and the rest we're not. 
Which is unique, right? Which is very unique in the benefit right. space. Can you talk about exactly. that a little bit? Yeah, usually you can't discriminate amongst employee types, but with uh, long-term care, you can, as long as you do it you know, based on job classification. We do a lot that are based on years of service. So employers okay. say, well, this is a long-term program, obviously long-term care, and we want to give it to our employees who are going to stay with us. For our yeah. employees to turn over each year, we don't really care. So we're not going to fund a plan for them. Right now, we're looking at some where they're saying, hey, if an employee's been here five years, we'll buy them a long-term care plan. And then right. they can buy more. Usually, employers will fund a base level, as you said, a base coverage funded by the employer. And then the employees can buy more from there. Once you get into the five, you know, three, four, five thousand and up employee lives, typically, they're not funding something for everyone. Okay. In the old days, they did because it was you know, much less expensive when they kind of mispriced it. But nowadays, if the employer does fund it, you know, it's typically somewhere between $25 and you know, $50 a month per employee on average. And then if it's an executive carve out, you know, they might be spending you know, hundreds a month per employee. What about the minimum participation requirements by the carrier? And I know this depends on the carrier and if the employer is funding a part of it. What do you think is maybe the range or typical given the participation limits? It can vary if you're doing a plan that has any sort of underwriting concession, whether it's guarantee issue or simplified underwriting, you're going to have a minimum participation requirement. Typically, it's you know, 10 applications approved or 10 lives approved, call it that. You know, if it's a small group, five employees, you know, you could do two or three that buy it and the other two or three don't. So, Mm -hmm. you know, less because they're fully underwriting those. Once you get into the small, everything's fully underwritten. So they're much more flexible on participation. What about the process? We've got an employer that is interested in, you know, setting up a solution for their employees. What does that process look like for them to, you know, get it all set up? It can be pretty painless for a couple of reasons. One of the main reasons is we these days try to do direct bill so that employees are paying this out of their bank account Mm -hmm. versus the employer payroll deducting it because all too often when employees leave employment, they look at their health insurance, their 401k, they forget about the long-term care. It's, you know, a kind of a tertiary benefit. They forget about it. They don't take it with them. And then months later, they come back and go, oh, I wanted to take that. And the plans mm-hmm. lapse. So they've lost it. And so one of our newer statements that we make is long-term care is one of the few employee benefits you should die with, yeah. right? You should hold it till you are no longer with us. Whereas with, you know, your employer health insurance, your employee group term life insurance, your employer disability, those are not policies and coverages you're going to take into retirement. Right. This is one by nature, you're typically going to use it around 80. So mm-hmm. you want to make sure you take it into retirement. So for that reason, when employees enroll, we just go ahead and do bank draft, EFT, ACH, however you want to call it. So there's no administration from the employer, right? They're not dealing with bills. They're not dealing with employees taking it when they leave because they already own it directly. So the lift is pretty minimal for the employers. The one thing that I will tell you is it is something that needs to be explained and employees need to be educated Mm -hmm. because there's, you know, human resource benefit people that don't know long-term care, Right. right? It's one of those, as we said, tertiary benefits, right? People have had group life, group long-term disability, group health for decades. Long-term care has just not been one of those. Right. And so it's important that you educate on this because employees don't know, well, what is it? long-term care? I thought I had long-term disability. Oh, well, Medicare pays for that or right. my health insurance pays for that. And as Confusion. we know in the industry, none of that is covered right. by Medicare. None of it's covered by your group health plan. And long-term disability is to replace your income, not pay for services when you need extra care. So it's super important to educate employees on that. And if the employer doesn't want to educate on that and it's a voluntary plan, then it's really not worth doing because gonna no flop. one's going to, it's going right? to flop and it's yeah. just going to be a disappointment for everyone. And you're not availing. So we all the time tell employees, they're like, well, we're too busy. We really can't do this. We can't do a big outreach right now. And they'll say, then we shouldn't do it right now. Yeah. We should do this at a time when it's good for you to make it worth your time. And so that your employees truly learn. They don't all have to buy, but they should all understand what 
decision they're making, yes or no. Yeah, I agree. And I know it's often said, and I think you guys probably say this too, is off cycle is usually a good time for employers to offer this benefit, right? And that means not an open enrollment when you're, you know, offering all of your other group benefits because it probably is going to get lost. It will Um, get lost. yeah. Yeah. And so if you're able to do this off cycle at a different time of the year and educate, 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 the importance of planning for the future, the importance of planning for LTC, you're going to have a better success rate. Yeah, very much so. We recommend five to eight emails. Okay. You know, where you're sending an email weekly just prior to the enrollment period started, during the enrollment period, holding webinars, right? And now everyone's comfortable with Zoom thanks to mm-hmm. COVID. That's, you know, one of the great right. things that not much great came out of COVID, but people's comfort with being on camera and using Zoom is really changed that. So educating through webinars and you can do recordings and videos, right? So it's super easy with technology today to educate people if the employer will, you know, set aside the time, encourage employees to understand it and then send out a few emails. But that's really the employer's lift is sending out some emails, meeting with the agent or producer benefit broker that's putting this in, you know, once a week, every other week to get it planned and going. It can be a pretty painless effort for the employer aside from, you know, some basic education. And now for a brief message from our show's sponsor. The Steadfast Care Planning Podcast is sponsored by Amada Senior Care Columbus. Amada is your one-stop shop for in-home caregivers, senior housing advice, and long-term care insurance claim assistance. Visit amadaseniorcare.com forward slash Columbus dash senior dash care to learn more. Just so everyone knows, I do work with Aegis and they are a very reputable company offering these LTC solutions to worksite. Can you talk about even doing those webinars? Like that's something that you assist in the process. So the employer doesn't have to come up with the content. Like you guys provide that content. Can you talk about that? There's really nothing the employer has to come up with. We put it all in front of them and then they just (laughs) approve or, you know, say, well, hey, we don't call our employees employees. We call them teammates, right? Sure. Or we call them associates. So that kind of thing and, and making sure the verbiage and the printed material matches their culture. But aside from that, myself and anyone out there that does what I do, they come to the table with, here's the content for your emails. Here's the postcard we want to send to the home if that's happening. And then here's the webinar and here's how we're going to explain it. And yeah, so everything's pretty much pre-baked. You know, we've been doing this for 25 years. You know, our goal is to not make the mistakes that we've seen made previously. So we can, you know, pretty much help. We always say, hey, we've made all the mistakes there are to make on this after 25 years. So we want to help you avoid them. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of just put it all in front of the employer and then make it match their culture and their feel. What do you think is reasonable for employers to expect as far as how long that process takes? You know, once you have that initial conversation, is this three months, six months, nine months, a year? What do you think is realistic? Typically eight weeks. If an employer says, let's run, we'll do meet with them weekly for four weeks to get it all set up. You know, half an hour meetings, maybe weekly to get it all set up. And then a month enrollment period, right? 30 day enrollment period. You could do two weeks if it's, you know, depending on what their cycle is, call it two to four weeks for an enrollment period. And then it's really a wrap up and a couple of meetings after that, just to wrap it up. So it's a lot less of a lift than a normal open enrollment when you're looking at open enrollment for medical or open enrollment for, you know, when you're doing four products at once, that can be consuming, which is, as you said, one of the reasons we do a lot of these off cycle is so mm-hmm. that you're not getting mixed in with the medical because, you know, the, it's the same reason they forget to take it with them when they leave. People are focused on medical, you know, dental, even pet insurance, you know, mm-hmm. your 401k plan. Long-term care is down the line. And if it's mixed in with everything else, a lot of times it'll get lost in the shuffle. Yeah. Direct bill is important there. And direct bill is super important. Well, Kevin, any other final advice or you think helpful information that's important to share about worksite long-term care insurance? Yeah, I think the the biggest thing is for people to know that there's great options out there. There's new carriers getting into this business, which isn't something we've said for a decade or two, right? right? I'll call it about 2010 until until 2020. We kind of call that the nuclear winter of long-term care. It just, (laughs) you know, there were fewer carriers employers weren't engaged in it. But I, you know, over the last three to five years, people are seeing this is a problem. 
And I think the, the most telling statistic that I've seen recently, I know statistics don't sell, but if you think about the volume of people needing this care, the people receiving long-term care right now are the silent generation, the you know World War II generation, and just after that, receiving long-term care. Right now, there's about 19 million of those people. Mm -hmm. There's 70 million baby boomers. Right, so four difference. times almost. And we're having a problem with long-term care right now, right? Medicaid's being mm -hmm. burdened by the states. States are looking for solutions. 62% of nursing home residents are on the welfare program, which is Medicaid, not mm -hmm. Medicare. So right. if we're having this problem today, and then the next 20 to 30 years, we're going to have four times the problem. It's going to be an issue that people are going to really need to wake up and start to address, both mm -hmm. at the employer level, at the individual responsibility level, and at the state and federal level. Right. We need to do proactive planning and not reactive planning. We don't want to wait yep. 20 years and get to it. And, you know, we are just, just crushed by this right. influx of baby boomers. And then what do we do? No, like we need to solve this problem now. How are right. these people going to pay for care? Who's going to provide care? And where are they going to receive that care? Those are all things that need to be addressed. It's one of the biggest problems of our society for the next two decades. No question. Agree. Well, Kevin, where can people find out more about Aegis and how you help people? Yeah, I would say, you know, AegisNetwork.com is a great place to start or just email, you know, myself or you, Kelly, and, you know, we'd love to help. We work with, you know, all size employers, all parts of the country. We're a specialist in this one little field. We don't right. do the other benefits. So most of our programs are with other benefit brokers or other insurance agents perhaps, you know, like yourself that specialize in long-term right. care. But when it comes to doing a 5,000 life group, you know, that might be larger than you have the resources or an individual agent has the resources for. We're just there to help people try to resolve this issue. And we've been doing it for 25 years and hope to be doing it another 25. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome, Kevin. As he said, I do partner with Kevin and Aegis. And so if there is an employer out there that is looking for a solution for their clients, I'm happy to help in that aspect. Partnering with Aegis and providing just top-notch solutions and support services, right? Caregiver right. platforms. We didn't even really dive into that in too much detail, but there's other support services that are available for employees, even if they're not on claim. Yeah. Ex exactly. Yeah. It's really, you know, we always say when someone gets pregnant, they get the book, what to expect when we're expecting, right? right? We get a book that tells us what's going to go on. With caregiving, no one's given us that book. We yeah. have to help people with this because it's crushing families, mm -hmm. people's health, people's ability to work. And there are things we can learn. It's, you know, if you've been through a caregiving event and I'm going into a caregiving event, I can learn a lot from you. It yeah. doesn't have to be a professional, right? It's right. just sharing. We don't have enough caregiver support groups at works. We think there should be more you know, support groups in the workplace down, you know, at the senior center, you know, let's help the caregivers mm -hmm. because most of us are going to be caregivers long before we're care recipients. And it's just nothing we've trained for or planned for. Absolutely spot on. Well, Kevin, thanks so much for your time today. Really Thank appreciate you. your time and expertise and have a great day. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kelly.